So we've, we've talked, this is our third conversation. Uh, what's on your mind today, Nolan? Well, I was kind of going to continue off uh, what we discussed in the previous video. Okay. Uh, at the beginning of the last video, we talked about the, the Gulag Archipelago. Mm -hmm. And I sent you an email earlier today with some of the excerpts that I thought were interesting. Let me pull that up. I haven't looked at email today. Okay. Let me see how small I can make my screen so I can see the email. Okay, go for it. Quote I so, mentioned in the previous video, uh, if only it were so simple, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and if it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being, and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Yeah, that's a, that's a great quote. Yeah, I like the last line as well. Yeah. Well, and that's that's true. I, I I actually often so people people have strategies for making the world better. That's that's a pretty normal thing. And one of the strategies is exactly as Solzhenitsyn describes. You've got the good people and the bad people, and so well, will you just if you get rid of the bad people, okay. Well, how are you going to get rid of them? Well, you could exile them, marginalize them silence them, exclude them, or kill them. Okay, and actually I think one of, the, one of the interesting test cases in the Bible of this is actually Noah's flood, because in Noah's flood, God saves the best man and his family out of all the world, and within a few generations, everything reverts back to normal, which in fact expresses Solzhenitsyn's observation here. So I think he's dead on right. Yeah. And so the second one there is about uh, Solzhenitsyn trying to find a way to remember his experience and not losing sight of what's important. Okay. Shall I read it? Sure. Okay. Each year on the anniversary of my arrest, I organize myself a Zex day, a prisoner's day. In the morning, I cut off 650 grams of bread, it's not a lot, put two lumps of sugar in a cup and pour hot water on them. For lunch, I ask them to make me some broth and ladle, and ladle of thin mush and how quickly I get back to my old form. By the end of the day, I am already picking up crumbs to put in my mouth and licking the bowl. The old sensations start up vividly. Gulag Archipelago, Volume 3, page 461. Wow. Yeah, I completely believe that. We are, we are, I, I always kind of chuckle when people admonish others to live in the moment. I, I've told stories about the homeless man that lived outside my office door, and people would say that I think he lives in the moment every day. It's a disaster. <laughs> but, but Solzhenitsyn forcibly reliving that moment um, every year in the anniversary of his arrest is, is also a helpful thing. Yeah, that was one of the things that I remembered most. And how do you, I mean, why, how does that, how does, why does that quote impact you? I think it's something useful for us to try and keep in mind when we're going through our day-to-day -day lives. So I find that, you know, sometimes it's difficult to be, to be grateful about what we have. And reading that book and that part really helps remind me of 
what how many good things I do have. Mm. It's also helpful to remember that even people who had a direct experience of losing almost everything, even they still have struggles with that if they are out of that environment long enough. I I often one of the one of the early, one of my early observations to the victim culture that I saw emerging was the sanctification of victims. And I immediately noted the interesting juxtaposition between that and another aphorism, which was that hurt people hurt people. In, in that it's often um, the victims of, let's say, child abuse, who some of the victims of child abuse, as Peterson reminds us, that grow up to become abusers themselves. Now, not all the victims of child abuse do, but some of the victims of child abuse do. And, and so on one hand, we imagine that those who have been victimized are somehow safe because they, they certainly wouldn't perpetrate those kinds of evils on others. But at the same time, we recognize that it's the, it's, it's often the it's often the pain that scar the pain and abuse that scars us and those scars spur us on to in fact continuing the hurt by doing it to others and so it's a it's a funny it's a funny juxtaposition in victim culture and i i think again solzhenitsyn gets that because he saw that the many of the, the cruelest guards had been victims of cruelty themselves. And so sometimes sometimes suffering makes us more compassionate and sometimes suffering makes us more angry so that we just simply continue it. So it's it's a fascinating observation. Yeah, I found what you did discusses that that that's useful to try and understand because he kind of says there's two different ways of responding to that suffering or victimization that you experience one way is to decide that you never want to be someone who does the same thing and the other way is to kind of get lost in your resentments about it and end up falling into the same thing that you yourself hated about what you experienced. It, it, is, a, it is a very interesting dynamic. And, you know, part of what, let's say, in, in Dante's Inferno, what is so interesting is that many of those in, in Dante's hell continue to try to work out or continue to, they go, they simply go deeper into the torments that brought them there. The, the same is true of C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, where someone whose who's predominant sin is complaining, the, the penalty for complaining is endless complaining. <laughs> and, you know, the, there's a mystery about redemption where the complainer finally gets sick of their own complaint to the degree that the, they realize they have to turn from themselves. And um, these are fascinating, fascinating relationships. Yeah, it's kind of like your own, um, your own behavior becomes your own punishment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's one of the interesting things about uh, Dante's Inferno about kind of all the symbolic 
punishments that we're going to it's I think some people would look at that story and not see that it's not exactly a like straightforward story about this thing that happened. Mm-hmm. It's more so about understanding what it's like to live in the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the punishments that I remember when I read it was kind of interesting was the the hypocrites were forced to wear this heavy cloak that weighed on them but on the outside it was all golden and shining but on the inside it was dark and heavy (laughs) yeah I think there was something else to it, but I don't remember. Yeah. I took a class on Dante in college and I, I, so many of the classes I took in college, if I had the chance to retake them, I'd get so much more out of them now. (laughs) Life is full of funny ironies. So uh, I guess we could read the next excerpt. Okay. Kind of funny, actually. The absurd degree of deception. They were building an apartment building, and if if anybody's, if nobody, if somebody's never read the Gulag, it's a it's a fascinating book. It's just story after story after story, and it's it's mind boggling to to understand how he could, you know, write this thing in secret and remember it all. And I mean, Peterson talks about the the ways that he got this book out there. It's, it's really a phenomenal thing. So they were building an apartment building and the free employees stole several, the free employees stole several bathtubs, but the tubs had been supplied to match the number of apartments. So how could they hand over the building, the apartment building as completed? They could not confess to the construction superintendent, of course. He was triumphantly showing the official acceptance committee around the first stair landing. Yes, and he did, not, he did not omit to take them into every bathroom too and show them each tub. And then he took the committee to the second floor landing and the third, not hurrying there either, and kept going into all the bathrooms. And meanwhile, the adroit and experienced Zex, the prisoners, under the leadership of an experienced foreman plumber, broke bathtubs out of the apartments on the first landing, hauled them upstairs <laughs> on tiptoe to the fourth floor and hurriedly installed and invited them in before the committee's arrival. And it was their lookout, and it, it was their lookout if they let the wool be pulled over their, and it was their lookout if they let the wool be pulled over their eyes. This ought to be shown in a film comedy, but they wouldn't allow it. There is nothing funny in our lives except funny takes place in the West. <laughs> That's a great story. And, and it, it, it would, it would be, I mean, in, in Western terms, you could imagine, you know, Luth, Lucy and Ethel doing something like this to try to, you know, Stay out of the trouble of, of Ricky and Ricky and Fred. Um, <laughs> so 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 what did what did you appreciate about that quote, Nolan? I think it's just funny that they went through all that to maintain this lie. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's a good kind of encapsulation of everything that went on in the Soviet Union at other places yeah. and, and why such a system can't last yeah <laughs> oh oh I have an uncle who was a who was a who was a cop 
and I used to, I used to, as a kid, I used to love to listen to his stories because he was a, he was a good storyteller and he would tell the best police stories because cops get all the good stories because this, this kind of thing, you know, might not be happening with the government as much or things like that. But, um, you know, just stupid, stupid criminal stories where, <laughs> Oh, I love it. I think that's another uh, positive if you're going to read this book is even in spite of all the dark stuff that it talks about, somehow there still seems to be humor to it. Yeah. And, and I think that's that's such a, I think that's actually a testimony to 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 the goodness of God that you know, sometimes people will comment to me about my humor with the mentally ill. Um, I tend to have gallows humor, but part of that is just because there, if you live in places where there is a lot of suffering and a lot of darkness, you know, about all you have left is laughter. And so when, when you see it, you might as well enjoy it because that's what you got. And I'm sure that's, that was that was that was the same in in the Soviet Union and in the Gulag and it, I've often noted that some of the best comedians in culture, if you find a really funny person, you'll almost always find some suffering that this person has endured. I, I think it's necessary. That's been my experience. Yeah. There's a documentary I watched about, I forget what it was called, but it was about how the, how the Holocaust created this kind of culture among Jewish people of stark humor and always trying to find something funny in the darkest places. There's a documentary on Netflix too right now, which which has a similar theme. They 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 look at, you know, they, they look at, for example, comedy comedy shows in Iraq, and you know, go into the Muslim world where it's in some ways the the most repressive, and you'll find you'll find great comedy. Yeah. So there's the next section is kind of funny as well. Okay. Two ridiculous arrests. The charge against uh, Gregory, I his Russian names, <laughs> yeah. Gregory Yamanovichi Generalov from Molensk province was that he used to drink heavily because he hated the Soviet government. <laughs> <laughs> he actually used to drink heavily because he and his wife got um, got along so badly. He got eight years. <laughs> he, <laughs> it could be that that he uh, maybe got a, maybe he was happy to get away from his wife. <laughs> uh, Irina Tukinskaya, the fiance of Sovrinsky's son was arrested while leaving church. The intention was to arrest their whole family. And she was charged with having prayed in a church for the death of Stalin. <laughs> Who could have heard that prayer? Terrorism, 25 years. <laughs> Prayed in a church for the death of Stalin. I love it. Oh, we can't have that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, that is good. <laughs> oh. Two examples of the malevolence that characterized the camps. Here is another imaginative trick. On the eve of May 1, 1933, in the Khabarovsk 
GPU for 12 hours at night, uh, Chirbotaryev was not interrogated, no, but was simply kept in a continual state of being led to interrogation. Hey you, hands behind your back, wow. They let him out of the cell, up the stairs quickly, and into the interrogator's office. The guard left. But the interrogator, without asking one single question, and sometimes without even allowing uh, Chebortaryev to sit down, would pick up the telephone. Take away the prisoner from, 10, from 107. And so they came to get him and took him back to his cell. No longer had he lain down on his board bunk than the lock rattled. Chebortaryev, to interrogation, hands behind your back. And they got, and when they got there, take the prisoner from 107. For that matter, the methods of bringing pressure to bear can begin a long time before the interrogator's office. Wow, yes. 12 hours they did this to the guy. You know, and this this gets into. Peterson's idea of, you know, we, we know how to torture each other <laughs> because we know what torture is ourselves. It's, it's, it's kind of similar to the, to the carrying sad bigs that Peterson mentions about the Holocaust. Where there's really no purpose to it except to make the other person suffer. Right. It's and you know this gets back to what we started talking about in terms of hurt people hurt people. It's a it's a strange type of pleasure that we we derive from the pain of others. And and we would we might imagine that. You know, you've got this idea of the mirror neurons. When we see pain, we, we often do things to either to act in compassion or to isolate us from the person who is in pain. But, but there's this other side of us that enjoys the suffering of others. And, and then we make up stories in our mind, um, usually that they're evil. Again, this gets back to Solzhenitsyn's first quote that they're evil and therefore the, the, the pain of the other is justifiable and our practice of, of giving them pain is justified. It's, I guess it's, you kind of put these, these kind of blinders on to kind of hide you from your true motives. But really behind it, sometimes it's just to make someone else suffer. Yeah, yeah. And we don't want to be seen that way, but we are that way. And so we, we even lie about our, our own nature to ourselves. It's kind of like when Verveke talks about the technical use of bullshit. Yeah. And it's like you're not really lying to yourself, but you're come about convincing yourself that you're not doing it for a bad reason. There's some other justification for it. Yeah, no, that's 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 really good. I like I like Verveke's observation with respect to bullshit, and and how that how that works in us, and and in a sense, the there there's something deeply redemptive and uh, corrective about our you know anti bullshit in that sense. So, no, that's true. I guess we may as well go through that last excerpt. That okay. one's a bit darker. And from the other uh, Solevsky inhabitants, 
he learns things more awful than his eyes perceive. People pronounce the fatal word Sekirka to him. This means Sekimaya Hill. Punishment cells were set up in the two cathedrals there. Oh my. And here is how they kept prisoners in the punishment cells. Poles, um, poles the thickness of an arm were set from wall to wall and prisoners were ordered to sit on these poles all day. At night they lay on the floor, one on top of another, because it was overcrowded. The height of the poles was set just so that one's feet could not reach the ground, and it was not so easy to keep balance. In fact, the prisoner spent the entire day just trying to maintain his perch. If he fell, the jailers jumped in and beat him, or else, they took him outside to a flight of stairs consisting of 365 steep steps from the cathedral to the lake, just as the monks had built it. In illustration four, the view up Sekimaya Hill as it is today. They tied the person lengthwise to a, to a balan, a beam, for, for the added weight and rolled him down it. And there wasn't even one landing. The steps were so steep that the, log of, that the log with the human being would just go all the way down without stopping. Wow, wow. You know, it's, 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 it's difficult to fathom the, the creativity that went into, that went into this. And see, see, part of see this this for me is part of why I, I can't be a materialist because when I think about when I think about the people that endured this, and when I think about the fact that probably many of them, their endurance of this was was the last of their life. I, I cannot imagine a universe without a God who will judge and will redeem because otherwise this world for me is, I don't know, I don't know. This, this, again, stories like this, I can't, I can't not be a Christian and see them, which seems completely opposite the motivation of others when they say, I can't believe in God because there's so much suffering in the world. Well, I can't believe in no God because of all the suffering in the world. Yeah, there's kind of new ways of looking at it again. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, what, what, what about these two stories um, grabbed your interest, Nolan? Well, I think the first one is a similar to what I just mentioned about um, the Peterson thing with the sad words and carrying them across. The second one is was more like enough like one story that kind of of all the rest of the stories like encapsulated all of them in some sense. So I included this excerpt in an essay that I was writing about about the gulag and this like the one story that really kind of give you an idea of what the rest of everything else was like. And uh, there's actually a picture of that hill that kind of makes put makes it seem even worse, but it's more so to see seen everything in one story and even you could say 
just evil in one story. It's kind of it's the real kind of thing in the story that that kind of gives you some ideas to what you're talking about when you say that word. On oh, and the fact that they they did it in a cathedral. And the fact that, of course, 365 steps obviously means is symbolic of the year and the, the taking the steps up would likely be a, a religious act and a, and a pilgrimage of sorts that, that the pilgrim would ascend to the, the, to the place of God and then to take that place and turn it into this. Yeah, I think um, I think God would uh, have something to say with those who did such a thing. Yeah, I never even noticed that until you said that. I didn't really think. I kind of saw that it was 365 stairs, but I never thought about that for the men. Now, to me again it gets into it gets into the the you know always the question of the problem of evil and the and the existence of god that evil is is pointed to as a reason why there is no god but I have this kind of ontological argument with respect to the, our hope for justice and the existence of God. It, it, would seem, it would seem if we have any belief or hope in justice that, that this really begs for the existence of God in the same way that C.S. Lewis's argument from desire begs for the existence of God. It doesn't prove that there's a God, but the, the fact that we, we internally, seem, seemingly nearly universally, have a sense of justice and a desire for justice would, would imagine that we would have, that, that there might be a justice giver who who put this in us um, and, and especially in the light of responding to the kind of intentional, willful cruelty that gets displayed in these stories. Well, I was kind of thinking about the same thing earlier today. And I thought about what Peterson kind of says about the universities and Kind of how they're helping push along this meeting crisis. And he kind of says that they're not telling a good story. So I was thinking about this idea of an ultimate justice, and that seems to be an even better story. Yeah. And, uh, than even what uh, Peterson kind of talked about, which I think was valuable in the first place. But I'm not sure if it's ultimately enough. So, so how's how's the writing coming, Nolan? Um, pretty good. I haven't written that much poetry lately, but I've been kind of working on my website. I'm glad to put some of that stuff out there. Good. Should be done probably by the end of the month. But I'm not sure what else I'm going to put on there yet besides a few poems. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm sure I'm sure folks who will watch this will um, will be interested 
in, in looking at your poetry. Can you recite any of it? Do you have any of it in your, in your head right now? Not really that I could recite, but okay. maybe talk about one that I wrote that kind of ties into what we're talking about. I wrote one that was kind of about the meaning crisis. And I kind of used the cathedral as the image to describe this. But it was more like an upside down cathedral, which is kind of interesting considering the staircase thing. We were just talking about, so I'll kind of use that as an image to describe this loss of meaning. And Kind of like when a, a collapse from this idea of heaven and earth to just earth. Because at the end of the poem, the cathedral falls down. And it turns the speaker into dust and the cathedral into earth. So we can use that to describe the collapse this materialist way of looking at things. That's an interesting image of an upside down cathedral. And when you say upside down, do you literally mean upside down that way on the, on the not, x-axis? Not exactly, but more in the, more in the symbolic sense. Okay. That one of the lines is about the choir and it's like there isn't any choir but there's this cacophony of church bells ringing rather than the harmonious thing and then I talk about the incense and instead of smelling good it smells like something decaying hmm. and so I just kind of took all these elements and just made them the opposite. That's interesting. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to you putting your website out there, and when you do, you'll have to you'll have to send me the link. Yeah. Sounds pretty labor intensive. Do you have to? I think. Do you have to dictate all of this? Yeah, I dictated, but it wasn't really that long of a poem. Okay. But it was more putting all these little details in. So that's one of the things that I find poetry works well for me. Because it's not a super long, it's not pages and pages of stuff to work with just more smaller things, but the work is really doing the small details. I'm trying to pay attention to each of the different elements. That was one of the things that I found interesting about Dante's Inferno. That he has all these things that you wouldn't necessarily notice by reading. Like split into three sections and then each stanza has three lines so there's all this thing point all these things pointing to the trinity and then it's like if you add all the cantos up you get 100 the square root of 100 is 10 which is the square of the trinity plus one, which is like the unity of the three. And then, of course, there's all the punishments that are kind of showing how it is that the sins that people committed kind of created this punishment. So that was a useful thing for me to read and figure out. 
I haven't, I haven't read Dante for a long, long time. And again, as I said, I took a course on it in college, but I think it's, 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 information is wasted on the young. <laughs> they need it, but it's, there's, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't appreciate it probably like I could appreciate it now. So, so, so you like, you like Dante, you like Solzhenitsyn. Um, what, what else, what else are you reading that you're enjoying? Well, I, I read that biography of Paul recently. Oh, and he writes. Yeah. I thought that was helpful to kind of understand the, the implications of the resurrection. Yeah. And why that's so pivotal to everything. I, I actually just had a conversation that Zoom didn't work, and so I, I can't I can't post it. But the conversation I had just before yours, we were talking about Peterson's um, Peter Peterson. That have you seen Peter's the video of Peterson at Liberty University yet? Yeah, I watched that. I don't, I don't saw your video about it. Okay, the it's the the person I was talking to mentioned how. You know, in, in many ways, and I think she was exactly right on this, Peterson uh, takes the resurrection more seriously than a lot of Christians, because Peterson, I think, recognizes, as the early church did, and other, other Christians have, obviously, throughout the centuries, Peterson recognizes that if the resurrection is true, it, it actually reframes all of our lives and it, it should it should make us free of care fearless and um it, it it should it should it should radically transform how we view this life but but even for christians that will say well i believe in the physical resurrection uh, we don't act like we do. We tend to mirror secularist assumptions about, we, we basically mirror secularist value systems. And if in fact, um, as, as one great saint said, that the sufferings of this world are as a, inconvenient night in a bad hotel to the glory that awaits us, that would transform how we deal with what we deal with now. But it doesn't in, in many of us. And that's, that's really something important to that, you know, I, so, so when Peterson at, at Liberty talks about, grappling with the resurrection i think he's i think he's thinking clearly yeah i thought it was also when i got out of that book was sometimes i think certain interpretations of christianity can lead people to believe that this life isn't important. But I found useful understanding that's more, more in the sense of heaven and earth coming together rather than what we're doing now is, or where was this earth isn't worth saving kind of thing. Yeah. But it's more so of the heaven and earth coming together which is a bit different a while ago i read uh nishi's frederick nishi's book of the antichrist and he had a problem with that idea of but i think it was partially a misinterpretation on his part didn't exactly didn't quite know what Paul was talking about 
with some of these things. Because he wasn't saying that um, that this world is evil on like evil and like damned to perdition as Peterson says I think but it's more so the uniting of the two things rather than this kind of binary way of looking at it I think that's I think that's right I'd love, I'd love to see, you know, a, a lot of the focus of Peterson's, well, he, you, as he keeps reminding us, he speaks as a psychologist. At some point, the, the metaphysical, the, the obvious metaphysical agenda of the Bible has to be dealt with, which, which, as you said, which is what I very much agree with, is the story of the reconciliation of heaven and earth. As you know, as Verveke notes, that's that's an axial age concern, but the that that is the message of that is the story of the Bible, and it, obviously the divorce of heaven and earth comes in in Genesis chapter three, and the resolution of it comes in Revelation twenty one. But it's the I, I think you're very much right in that the getting the understanding the the value balance of this age and the age to come is vital and and the bible continues to demand both this world is important and the life of the age to come is important and they are deeply connected and continuous and but that that poses problems for us we just have problems with value hierarchies we're not good at it but it's that's no it's true that's true it's a good observation and then that kind of gets into the other thing you've talked about recently which is what kind of role do we have with regards to the age to come how much of our agency or not agency how does that all balance out that's one of the harder questions to try and figure out <laughs> to say the least <laughs> hard indeed christian the, the, the best the, the best Minds in Christianity have been struggling with it for 2,000 years. Yeah. Well, and it was interesting to me, and I'll, I'll do a video later this week, I hope, on, on the second video, the one more question video that David Nasser does with Peterson, where they, you know, where they get, get down to wrestling with it. And Peterson says, well, I'd, you know, talks about how he's trying to think about it. And I thought, yeah, you, you and you and Augustine and Calvin and the Roman Catholic church and Martin Luther. And, you know, how does God work and how, and, and, and uh, Joseph from Genesis, you know, how does God work and our work, how, how do those things come together? We don't know. We don't know. Yeah, that, that kind of goes into the the God number one thing and the God number two. And for me, I'm fairly comfortable with God number one. But God number two is something that's I still don't quite have a grasp on. It's uncomfortable with the when everything is a theory, but then when the theory starts, what does the theory mean for you in your life? 
that's when things start getting a little more uncomfortable for me. Yeah. Well, and, and the world that, that actually also maps onto the world as a forum for action, which is, of course, the, the great fork at the beginning of Peterson's maps of meaning. The world is a, is a forum for form for action while well, action demands decision of us and decisions have consequences and some of those consequences are quite enduring. So yeah. Yeah. Stuff stuff. Well we got a we got a few more minutes. Any any last things you wanted to get in, Nolan? Uh, I'll have to think for a second here. I think I covered most of it, but I'll just I'll say one more thing here. Really appreciate that you're able to do this on your channel. I find it useful because you just kind of let people come on here and talk about whatever they want and they're not worried about them saying something that isn't quite right or isn't quite how you see things. That's one of the things kind of missing. the question you have or the doubts you have about things I find it's, it's more productive than trying to trying to get everyone to see things the same way from the beginning well so, thank you it's it's I find it a joy because, well, I don't see everything clearly. I'm not right about everything. And as you know, I think there's a lot of good rules in Peterson's 12 rules. And, and one of his rules, which I think is very true, listen to someone as if they have something to teach you. And if you actually do that rule, you will discover that pretty much everyone has something to teach you. And that's, I think, a part of of the glory of God's common grace that uh, God scatters his wisdom and his glory throughout. And I, I think the, the hierarchies that develop, that limit the number of voices we hear to those that the crowd uh, pushes up the hierarchy uh, actually impoverishes us. And so I, I I'm, I'm delighted that I've been able to have the time and and use use my channel in this way. I think, oh, this is what YouTube is for, actually. Yeah, I really like watching the other conversations as well. The uh, one you posted recently about uh, the violinist, that was pretty hard to ignore well the, the stories you know a god is the best god is the best story writer <laughs> of history because history is the story he's writing and as a again as a pastor you learn the stories out there are they're, they're way more than, than even the bravest fiction writer would dare imagine. And so it's, it's wonderful having the opportunity to sit and steward and listen to these stories. So, and you're, you're part of that too, Nolan. Yeah. Yep. So, so thanks for the conversation. And I, I like the, I like the quotes that you sent me. And I think that that structured it. I think that that structured it quite nicely. So, and you know, that's, I, I just kind of give an open channel and you know, it's, it's great to see what comes. So yeah. I appreciate it. So 
this time we covered most of the stuff I had written down. So <laughs> good. So so do I have your permission to post this? Would you like me to post it? You can post it. Okay. All right. I will do that then. It'll probably be in a few days. I've got a few, I've got a few yeah. stacked up. So yeah. all right, Nolan, you take care. You too. Okay. Bye bye.